Welcome to another edition of the Brattlecast. This is Jordan. Great to be with you. Jordan Rich is the name, and uh, my co-pilot in this adventure is the man himself, Ken Gloss. He's the founder and, well, not the founder. Your dad was the founder. Founding family. Founding family of the Brattle Bookshop, now located on West Street. But you've been there so long, you're you're like the, uh, the great historian who just sits at the top of the hill and tells all, has yeah. all the knowledge. Well, you know, when you start thinking about it, that I've been doing this so long, and then my father actually took it over when it was going out of business. So what it is now, it's been in my family for 74 years. It doesn't seem that long, but I guess it is. And everybody keeps getting younger and younger. Isn't that amazing? I noticed the same thing. Well, uh, a lot of folks respond to the podcast and respond uh, with questions and requests, and we have one that we wanted to fulfill today. And it's a gentleman who wrote in and says, Gee, I'd like to know what some of Ken's favorite things are, to quote uh, the song from Sound of Music. What are they? What are we going to do? Well, first of all, he wrote in a few times, and so I feel uh, that I, uh, I have to respond to it and, and want to, to be quite honest. The trouble is it's a really hard question because, you know, so many wonderful things come in, so much gets to the store, so much is interesting that it's hard to sort of pick out what is that the more fun or the the real memorable. And almost everything that I am going to say in the next 15 minutes or so, one of the things that sort of gets them individualized and why they're some of my favorites, they all have a good story. It's not that, oh, I that it sold for X number of dollars, because that actually... It either sells or doesn't sell, but it still might not be something they say. But it's where did it come from? Right. Why is it important? What does it make you feel like? Uh, uh, and I'll start off. I'm going to do this a little bit quick fire. Okay. But I uh, got called by a museum once to do an appraisal. I, I'm a member of the museum. I said, I'll do it for free. I love your museum, but I want to do this item. I want to do it from the item. I don't want to do it from your website. I don't want to do it from a copy. I want the original, and I'll do it for free. And they said, no problem. Come down, make an appointment. Came down, four-page, handwritten account of Paul Revere's ride by Paul Revere. Oh, my God! So you're sitting there holding this that wow. Paul Revere wrote up a few days after the ride, explaining how they were going to shoot his head off, get off the horse. Uh that that exists is is almost amazing to me, and I get to touch it and hold it. Another time, I got called by another museum. Uh, they were forming a museum, and they had some other things. They called myself and my manager and said, can you come in and look at this? They didn't tell me what it was. They just said, could you come and look? And we said, fine. A plain folding table in a basement, not, nothing special, the original copy of the Bill of Rights, the Pilgrim Charter, and a printed copy of the Declaration of Independence that was a year after the original, first one ever to have the names on it. But in ink, it was signed at the top. This is a true and authentic copy, John Hancock. That's so interesting because we've talked about things like the Declaration of Independence and people think, oh, I've got a Declaration of Independence. Well, it's not exactly that valuable. But that sounds very, very valuable and impressive. are in the state archives, Mm -hmm. and there's a museum near the Kennedy Library that's the archives museum, and they're now all in those cases for display. Uh, One time someone brought me a book, and it was from about the 1870s and 80s, but it was a small book, and it had these beautiful, beautiful illustrations of older, sort of trying to recreate illuminated manuscripts. It was all in black and white, beautifully done lettering, absolutely gorgeous. And you're looking at it, boy, did they print this beautifully. And then you look at it and look at it closely. It wasn't printed. It was all woven silk. Oh, my gosh. It was absolutely woven silk. And you look at this, the pages were silk, all of the lettering, all the illustrations. It was done by a silk company, and they made a number of copies for their best customers in the 1870s and 80s. But it's like, how did they ever do this? And they did it with punch cards and a jaconet process, uh, the manufacturing. That, that book, I got it, was able to buy it. 
I even take pictures of it. I hope another copy comes in, but it's now in a museum. So that was a, a great item. And then some of them are just things I like and are fun. So I hope whoever asked me this is listening because you're going to have to stop me at some point because <laughs> I'm going to uh, – I love baseball. I love. Yes, we've uh, talked about that often. But to have a copy of the Spalding's book on the history of baseball, which was done in 1911, and it's a nice book, a fairly valuable book, done in 1911 on baseball. It's collectible. But to have a copy inscribed by Joseph Spalding to a man named George Wright. Now, you have to be maybe particularly a Bostonian. But George Wright and Spalding uh, both played for the Red Sox in the 1800s, in the early 1900s. They both are in the Hall of Fame. And for one Hall of Famer to sign it to another Hall of Famer, and they both started sporting good companies. Well, that was my next question. Yeah. Uh, the Spalding name is known Spal- world, worldwide. I, and Wright as well? Wright Ditson is, ah. uh, was a big spot. And, you know, you've seen that, and and George Wright, when he got the book, in a couple of the photographs in it, wrote, "No, this is so and so," and he made corrections. And you have sort of it, early baseball just sort of comes out, comes and alive. It, it comes yeah. alive. Uh, another one, uh, we got a whole bunch of cookbooks in. We put a bunch of the pamphlets outside, and this isn't a valuable book, but. We had we had so much to do. I said, just it will be a bargain. Man comes running in with one of the pamphlets two hours later. Absolutely thrilled, beside himself, just on and on and on. I, I, it's hard to describe how. Ha- I wish <laughs> I had had a video of this man. He was thrilled, and it, then he said, and it's only a dollar, and I've been looking for years. And you look at the title, and it's coconuts and constipation. I thought that was a rock group, Coconuts and Constipation. <laughs> and, and he was thrilled. And so it wasn't so much the item. It was the reaction that he <laughs> had to this item that it was— That may that, be the greatest title of any book ever, by the way. <laughs> no, I, I assure you there are, there are loads and loads of fun and interesting titles. Yeah. Uh, but you get photographs. My wife collected books on jazz— and we had some signed photographs, one of a marquee saying uh, Louis Armstrong and then in smaller letters with Billy Holiday. Mm. But it was inscribed to Pops Who Taught Me Everything, Billy. Oh, my gosh. Uh, and, my so, gosh. You know, these are all items that you touch and hold and, and get to see and learn the history about them. And they don't all have to be extremely high priced. It, extremely rare. Um, I one time, uh, uh, living, living a uh, title of a book, Living to an Old Age, Optimistic View. <laughs> so, you know, just like that yeah. r- creates a smile. And, you know, when you're collecting, when you're getting things, when you touch them and hold them, it's the fun of it. And, I, I know that you're in the business, obviously. You're one of the kings of this industry. But it almost seems as though the universe is looking out for you as you're looking out for it, right? I mean, you're, you, people know what you do, but you seem to be attracted to things, and they come to you a lot of the time. Well, we buy books mostly from houses and estates, and people are older, moving from the big to the small, or it's right. an estate. And so it's always that treasure hunt. It's like being Jim Hawkins on Treasure <laughs> Island every day. And then also being able to, when you do see that, to recognize what it is, to realize why this might be important. Or some of it comes in and, and you're always learning and, and getting something new. Uh, one, of, one of the uh, items that we had, and this was years and years ago, a uh, copy of The Great Gatsby, which is still a very popular book, mm-hmm. but it was inscribed to the greatest living poet, T.S. Eliot, sincerely F. Whoa. Scott Fitzgerald. Then T.S. Eliot annotated the whole book. And and so you have the connection of these two great men. But it's one of the things I also like in the store, and like I say, you're going to have to stop me when we reach we, time. We're, because we're, I could go, but 
I love old newspapers and, and magazines. Now, I one time had gotten a newspaper from the 1770s, and it was from Salem, but it was an account of the Boston Massacre. Mm. And, you know, first of all, you're saying to yourself, someone in 1770 in Salem, this is, they were first reading about the Boston Massacre. One of the things, though, that told you things that were totally different is I read the first sentence. It was 120 cent words long. How many editors at the Globe or the New York Times do you think would allow a 120-word sentence? It just goes to show you the, <laughs> the generational differences between scribes back then and now. But one of the one of the also one of my favorite ones is I used to give talks once a year to a fifth grade class in Westwood, Massachusetts. There was there were four or five of us professionals. There was uh, someone from the aquarium. There was a radio announcer. There was a man who specialized. He was a sociologist, but only in uh, serial killing. Uh, there was a musician. Uh, and we talked to the class about it. It was a career day. And I used to always bring a bunch of 100, 150-year-old newspapers, 60 or 70 of them, to give out to the class. I mean, I, I figured a few of them might really enjoy mm. the fact. And it was for them. And I one time got a response. It got a lot of thank yous, and the kids were great. But I got a response from one of the kids, and I never forgot this. He said, you know, I really appreciate your old newspaper, but I really don't collect old newspapers, but I collect old coins. And he says, and I have some coins from the year the newspaper came out. I wonder if somebody bought that newspaper with my coin. Oh, wow. And for a fifth grader to put that That's... all together, that – you're asking what some of my favorites is. It wasn't that the newspaper was important. It wasn't that the coin was important, but that this fifth grader could put all that together and respond. It just sort of sent a, a joy uh, to me. Well, to sum it all up, it's coconuts and constipation, my friend. One, though, I'm going to finish it with one last story okay. of my favorite book, my most valuable book, the book that absolutely means the most to me. I have a – there's a copy of a, The Night Before Christmas. Mm. It's a 1980s copy. It's a nice copy, beautifully illustrated. Uh, and you'd look at it and go, huh? Why? I mean, it, that is the copy that I have read to my children. They're in their later 30s now. Every Christmas Eve since the time they were born. Now I've read it to my grandchild – children. We have three of them. Every Christmas Eve – that they've been, and the oldest is three, to the point where my daughter is married to someone in Texas. Now, she's very smart. They live in, uh, in this area in Boston. But they would go to Christ uh, Christmas in Texas. Before FaceTime, I even recorded it on YouTube so that she could see me reading it to her on Christmas Eve in Texas. My other daughter lives now in Nairobi, so on FaceTime, I have to – eight hours I have to allow yes, for it. Yes. But this copy of The Night Before Christmas means more to me, is more special, is more valuable to me than almost any other book because it has more meaning. You couldn't have capped off your favorites list with a better one than that, uh, Ken. And I, I've heard you talk about that when we've talked about Dickens and all and all the great yeah. stuff in Christmas. But thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, I hope the, the listener – feels somewhat satisfied. I would think he would. You know, the, the, the reality is that that question could go on and on. Well, there's always another podcast opportunity it, to do it, another section. And the other thing is the favorite book is always the one that's coming in in the future that I don't know about. There you go. Folks, you've been listening to Ken Gloss. I'm Jordan Rich. This has been the Brattlecast. We hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. We'll join you next time.